All right, I'll just do a quick introduction and then you can get on if you want. Right. <laughs> so here we have Philly Yenna, so graciously joining us to talk about the history of capitalism and transactivism in Turkey. Um, Philly Yenna is currently a master's student at SOAS in London. Philly reads and analyzes some of the most important topics to date, from queer Marxist theory, migration studies, to abolitionist, abolitionist pedagogies. Quite, quite a tongue twister there. And I'll just share the Instagram and chats if you want to go and follow them and give them some support. Thank you so much for being here, Philly. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> and thank you, Cass, for the presentation before. It was so interesting. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, history of capitalism through social reproduction and notes on transactivism and from transactivism in Turkey. Okay. Um, brace yourself because the presentation will be quite uh, academic heavy, but I've tried to sort of like make it as accessible as possible and make the concepts as simple as possible. So, um, first of all, some uh, guiding questions um, for these presentations. And in general, these are the guiding questions behind this project. I've been reading a lot on these issues, um, wrote a bunch of essays or also just a bunch of like personal notes that I put down uh, on the themes that I will touch upon. Um, yeah, and this presentation is an attempt to make it into a format that is a bit more accessible than academia um, and hopefully have a discussion about it. Um, I will, the presentation is kind of divided into two parts. There is first a more theoretical uh, part and then secondly I will look at um, a book in detail that is Queer in Translation by Evren Sabci, but I will get into that later. And between the two parts, I will ask whether there's any questions on first the theoretical part, and then at the end, just mm, random questions. Um, but also everyone feel free to just raise your hand or even just turn your mics on and interrupt me. Um, if there's something that doesn't sit right, or if there's any clarifications that you would like, but um, yeah, hopefully this will be quite simple. Um, so the questions are, what if we think of heterosis patriarchy not as a cultural feature of society, but rather as a historical and structural condition for the development and functioning of neoliberal capitalism? What role does the sanctioning of trans bodies play in the restructuring of social reproduction, care and the family? And are exploitation and dispossession two separate axes of oppression, and it follows our recognition and redistribution to separate axes of resistance. Um, I'm just going to give some like guiding definitions. Um, don't take them as like the definitions of the concepts, but more it's kind of like how I'm understanding these concepts so that we are on the same page throughout the presentation. So first of all, I think the way this presentation links to trans histories is um, through historiography, because I'm trying to uh, put forward a methodology of history uh, or other people's methodology of history. Um, and I want to look at history and I want to, to look at uh, political events, uh, especially in relation to LGBTQIA plus issues and trans issues um, by looking at the relationship between capitalism and the family and the household. So um, I'm going to cite Gleason and Ururke, who are the editors of Transgender Marxism. In the introduction of Transgender Marxism, they say, so to grasp capitalism as it plays out in our lives is to grasp the oikos, which in Greek means household, as it shapes history, as households replenish themselves, our personal histories mingle with the fate of our governing mode of production. So I'm putting forward, um, yeah, uh, a study of the relationship between the market, capitalism, and the family, or the household, or oikos. Um, I'm going to talk about neoliberalism a lot, but at the same time, I'm not going to get into 
any specific analysis of neoliberalism in itself. And I want to think in this presentation of neoliberalism more in relation to its social imaginary, which is a social imaginary that is funded, founded on individualism, on self-reliance, on privatization, ultimately. So kind of a social imaginary that opposes attempts to be interdependent and um, put forward alternative ways of being together that go beyond um, the idea of us as single individuals that never intersect with others and who follow kind of our own good and our own self-interest. So that's what I'm referring to as neoliberalism. Um, I will talk about queerness and transness a lot. When I talk about transness, I usually refer to an embodied transness, but also to a gender queerness more generally, um, and also referring to some sort of the debates that are present between uh, understanding of transness as a mere epistemology, uh, so kind of a way of knowing and a way of rethinking knowledge and rethinking knowing the word and transness as a material reality an embodied transness so kind of being trans um i'm looking at both and i'm also looking at the tension between the two of them and then um, i'm going to refer to queerness more generally and the presentation especially in the first part refers to queerness more generally but i want to stretch what we think of queerness stretch its boundaries and think of queerness not simply as a marker of sexual or gender deviance, but also think of queerness as indicating all bodies that are queered. So all bodies that are queered within capitalism, according indeed to a logic of exploitability and a logic of disposability. And then lastly, with exploitation and dispossession, I look at exploitation as a social relation that brings about capital accumulation. So a social relation uh, in which we are all more or less embedded in um, as waged workers and as workers within capitalism. But as we will see, we are not all just exploited, but a lot of us are dispossessed as well. So I'm looking at dispossession as the specific use of state force or private corporations force to cut off access to the means of production and subsistence of some individuals. And this tension between an analysis of capitalism as mere exploitation um, and or as mere dispossession is gonna inform uh, the presentation. So um, this is a bit of the theoretical and analytical background. And I wanted to have this slide because in the next slides in the theory, I'm going to kind of present more of my understanding of the theory, but to kind of just cite and give it justice, here are some of the books that guide this presentation. So we have Black Marxism by Cedric Robinson, um, which really represents probably one of the biggest challenges to Marxism. Um, and I will tell you why. And then we have Rethinking Racial Capitalism, that is kind of a development of Black Marxism uh, in 2018, a redevelopment that centers also social reproduction theory. In terms of social reproduction theory, we have Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici, uh, and social reproduction theory in itself, which is an edited book of different essays about social reproduction. Um, and then we have Carceral Capitalism, that is a reworking of racial capitalism, it's also a reworking of social reproduction, but also of Afro-pessimism and of necropolitics, um, which is a theoretical framework developed by Akhile Mbembe um, that kind of um, reworks the concept of biopolitics, Foucaultian biopolitics, um, and that all fits into carceral capitalism, which adds the crucial um, variable of the carceral state and prisons as part of capitalism. Um, and what these books do is they kind of um, tell us that not everyone is a worker under capitalism. We can't think of everyone as a waged worker under capitalism. Some people do not enter wage working relationships. Therefore, 
it poses the question whether capitalism really is a process that homogenizes, as Marx thought about it, or maybe it's a process that differentiates. Um, and that challenge to Marxism uh, stemmed from Black Marxism um, by Cedric Robinson. So Robinson's contribution is really going beyond the exploitation motive when analyzing capitalism. Um, Robinson said, and here I'm citing, something of a more profound nature than the obsession with poverty was askew in a civilization that could organize and celebrate on a scale beyond previous human experience, the brutal degradation of life and the most acute violations of human destiny, of course, referring to slavery. Um, so Robinson adjusts Marx um, by not seeing capitalism as a rupture from European feudal society, from feudal relationships, but rather capitalism as integrating those feudal relationships. And Robinson documents slavery before capitalism within Europe, precisely Irish slavery uh, by English rule, um, and also Roman Sinti slavery, uh, moreover, um, within Europe. Um, and they tell us that these feudal relationships of exploitation through difference play into capitalism. So capitalism is not this modernizing rupture moment in history. Um, Marx saw homogenization within classes. So Marx kind of thought that waged work exploited workers and kind of brought everyone at the same level. We are all the same exploited individuals. While Robinson says that capitalism, in capitalism, there's a tendency to differentiate and exploit difference. He opposes the idea that class can be universal while race is always particular and rather tells us that race is also universal. Uh, because racism and capitalism are actually not two different systems, but capitalism needs racism and racism needs capitalism. Race, in Robinson's analysis, is crucial for the formation of cons class consciousness in Europe. So it's not a particular feature of society, but it's rather a universal feature of society. It's how society is shaped. Um, and that's the same in carceral capitalism. Wang takes, J.K. Wang takes this and, and sees capitalism as operating on two axes, an axis that homogenizes people, but also one that differentiates people. The first one operates through exploitation, while the second, um, so exploitation through wage work, while the second one through expropriation, dispossession, through racialized and gender, dis so sorry, expropriation through racialized and gender dispossession. And so the con big contribution of this that is also taken by um, Gilmore, and there's also a link to the to a YouTube video. I'm not going to play it because it's really long, but um, I'm going to give you guys my email at the end and I can privately send you the presentation slides so then you can access the YouTube video and just access the material more generally. Um, and in this video, Gilmore says that all capitalism is racial. Capitalism will not stop being racial if all white people will disappear from the story. So it really is the tenets of capitalism. Racism is the tenets of capitalism. And the same goes with an analysis of gender and sexual deviance, especially gender deviance. Um, that is the one that informs Caliban and the Witch by Silvia Federici. So Silvia Federici um, also moves to, there's a move in that book to find a unitary explanation of capitalism, an explanation of capitalism, patriarchy, and slavery all together and to see how those things play with one another. So um, social reproduction theory as developed within Taliban and the witch, but also other contribution starts with the idea that again, not everyone is a worker under capitalism. Silvia Federici tells us that capitalism is founded on the dispossession uh, of specific bodies from the category of wage workers. So some bodies are not permitted entrance within the relations of exploitation and of wage work. She signals three processes that brought to this. The first is colonialism and land theft that happened through colonialism. 
slavery uh, as a result of colonialism, but also, as Robinson says, it's prior to colonialism, just con capitalism. It just continues through colonialism and capitalism. And also the gender binary. So the gender binary and hetero cis patriarchy are the three processes that signal primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation, which is a very big concept within Marxism, we can kind of think about it as the necessary process that um, for the development of capitalism, the, that the first and prior theft of resources. And those resources are land and labor power that becomes the unwaged labor power. And that is the power of black people under slavery in the transatlantic slavery and also the labor of women or gender variant bodies, I like to think. And that's what Federici mostly documents um, later on. And she documented it through a medieval history of Europe. So prior to capitalism, again. So capitalism, not as a rupture from a prior system and not as a rupture that modernizes the world, but rather capitalism as a system that exploits previous feudal social, social relations um, and creates a system of exploitation and dispossession within it. Um, so women were excluded from wage work and relegated to housework. Housework is unpaid labor, is labor that women and gender variant bodies usually carry for the reproduction of the worker. Just think about uh, food or cleaning a house, everything that goes into a reproduction, the reproduction of a body that then enters wage relations and produces something for capitalist accumulation. Therefore, we need to shift um, from creating a binary between reproduction and production and rather see how reproduction plays directly into production and reproduction has a huge value. And these processes create racial and gender difference because certain bodies who are marked as different are relegated to housework or to non-retributed uh, work, for example, slavery itself. Uh, Battacharya, Garji Battacharya, who's the writer of racial capitalism, the reworking of black Marxism, tells us that the hidden and unvalued work that surrounds and precedes wage labor and which allows wage labor to be possible is a matter at the heart of how humanity comes to be divided and allocated differential value. So we see this idea of difference, like how is difference created and the relegation of certain bodies to housework or to unpaid work is how difference is created according to social reproduction theory. And we can think about the also this kind of um, co uh, constant undervaluing of uh, social reproduction activities, which we could also say care that is much more simple than social reproduction. I mean, social reproduction is not only care, but care is a big part of it. We can see it today, like we can see it in the way the NHS is underfunded. We can see how constantly structures of care are underfunded and privatized. It's the cost of care doesn't fall on capitalism and on the modes of production, but falls on private households or private individuals. Um, here we've got some manifestos from the International Wages for Housework campaign which was a grassroots women's movement campaigning for recognition and payment for all caring work in the home and outside. It was started in 1972 by, by Maria Rosa de la Costa, Silvia Federici, Bridget Cartier, and Selma Jones, who first put forward the demand for wages for housework. Um, the poster on the top left, Child Custody, Custody Motherhood Lesbianism, is created by Wages Due Lesbians, which were um, a branch of the International Wages for Housework movement. And it was a group of lesbian people um, who were demanding retri uh, retribution for the emotional care work that they were doing as lesbian, a lot of them mothers, a lot of them just people. And they were saying to be a lesbian woman in this society requires a huge amount of work to reproduce myself, reproduce my loved ones, that is not being retributed. And they were demanding for that retribution. Um, 
I apologize that there's no sources for the images. I forgot to put them in, but when this will up be uploaded on YouTube, like in the caption, there will be all the sources to the images themselves as well. Um, so let's move on and look at how heterosis patriarchy specifically plays into this. So early social reproduction theory, especially Nancy Fraser, um, argued that patriarchy was the cause of the exploitation of women, but that heteronormativity was just a cultural feature, a cultural way for patriarchy to develop. So there was kind of a division between patriarchy as a structure and they realized that patriarchy was a structure, but heteronormativity, so kind of a, the focus on sexuality was not structural, it was cultural. They see sexuality just as a cultural feature of how we come together, which is very different from how social reproduction theory then developed, especially thanks to queer Marxists. Um, so, there was a debate, a big debate between Butler, uh, Judith Butler and Nancy Fraser in 1997, um, where Butler was like, actually, no, heteronormativity shapes the mode of production and reproduction within capitalism. Heteronormativity is structurally linked to capitalism and capitalism wouldn't be capitalism if we wouldn't be a heteronormative society. That is also taken by, taken again by Nguyen in 2021, um, when they wrote a really good article that says that heterosis patriarchy can be defined as the unification of sex, gender, and desire in binaries where male is differentiated from or elevated above female, and heterosexuality is differentiated from elevated above homosexuality. This differentiation that we are all witness of plays, according to Butler, into the mode of production and reproduction in three ways. So first of all, in the sexual division of labor, but that was already said by social reproduction theory. Second of all, in the idealization of the heteronormative family as the reproductive nucleus par excellence. And this is really crucial because we start seeing the role of the family. And thirdly, the reproduction of a particular sexed, gendered and abled, I add, individual as the proper productive subject of capitalism versus su subject whose bodies are marked for exploitation, but especially for dispossession. So we start grasping the family as a nucleus where this individual that can properly participate within capitalism, um, the family plays a huge role into this. Um, so, and this is taken also by Sophie Lewis in Abolish the Family, a Manifesto for Care and Liberation, and Transgender Marxism, um, which is probably the best edited volume we have at the moment in terms of queer Marxism, because it has so many different contributions. Um, and that is also quite famous now, so I feel like probably a lot of you have heard of or have read. Um, and what this contribute what these books tell us is that we have to look at the family we have to look at the family because the family is sophie lewis says it's the microcosm of the nation state within the family a proper properly productive individual is created for production those individuals which are placed outside of the family who can't access the family are usually individuals who do not fit this kind of idea of productivity and proper proper reproduction and when i say proper reproduction i mean that it's not that they're not reproducing or they're not caring but rather that their efforts of care are seen are threatening to capitalism itself because they pose an alternative to the neoliberal idea of a privatized care structure. And we can just think about how trans people come together, especially trans people of color, working class trans people of color, disabled trans, trans working class people of color, and the efforts that these groups um, undertake to care for each other within a system that deems them disposable. So the family. Um, the family, as we said, is a heteronormative nucleus and where heteronormativity thrives. But what about homonormativity, homocapitalism, or what is usually referred to as rainbow capitalism? 
So if the family is the nucleus where reproduction takes place and its costs are privatized, we also have to consider that this process has entered an era of crisis, especially after 2008 with the, new with the financial crisis caused by neoliberal structural adjustments within the world. This care crisis um, is explained by Fraser, Nancy Fraser, the person that I was criticizing before, but then she kind of started writing things that might make, make much more sense. Um, and I'm now citing Nancy Fraser from her contributions within social reproduction theory, the edited volume by Tati Bhattacharya. And Fraser, Fraser says that on the one hand, social reproduction is a condition of possibility for sustained capital accumulation, but on the other hand, capitalism orientation to unlimited accumulation tends to destabilize the very processes of social reproduction on which it relies. So it's kind of the idea that capitalism always follows this logic of profit and this logic of accumulation, but profit and accumulation don't fit together with care. If you're following that logic all the time, there's not going to be time for care. And care enters in a crisis. How does neoliberalism today um, account for that crisis? The way it accounts for that crisis, a lot of author think, is by kind of expanding what is considered as a productive, re properly productive and properly reproductive household. Uh, Raha uh, in Transgender Marxism tells us that the state has begun to recognize homosexual households only as the meeting of social needs has become more thoroughly privatized than ever before. The queer subject who is internalized then, it's a subject, a subject that is internalized within the state and the market, is a subject that is properly productive because it's a depoliticized and demobilized gay constituency that is anchored in domesticity and consumption. And this is this contribution comes also from Lisa Duggan's idea of homonormativity. Um, homonormativity as um, the way in which LGBTQ politics have been, uh, or better LGB politics have been uh, articulated uh, in the 2000s, um, in a way that does not challenge heteronormativity, in a way in which uh, some gay individuals are included within the apparatus of the market, the apparatus of the state, the family, and also of the nation. And the nation is signaled by Poir, Poir's contribution in 2007, that is Terrorist Assemblages, which is a great book that talks about homonationalism, homonationalism as the idea, and it's very relevant today, the idea of um, the colonial, like the pr reproduction of the colonial idea of the world as divided between a progressive and a traditional part of the world, a developed and an underdeveloped part of the world. And the developed part of the world is undertaking this gay-friendly pink agenda, and through this pink agenda is um, discriminating and allowing for foreign policy that discriminates the part of the world that is marked as backwards or traditional. And here we have a picture of Israel today, uh, which is very relevant. You've got um, the um, Israeli flagged, uh, flag uh, colored with rainbows. And on the right side, you've got Israeli soldiers oppressing, as they always do, to support the occupation of Palestine. And Israel really uses this rhetoric of, um, I'm the only country, I'm the only democratic country in the Middle East, I'm the only gay-friendly country in the Middle East, we're actually at safe heavens for gays in the Middle East, which is absolutely not true because Israel itself, and I'm gonna say this but then stop here because otherwise we go beyond the scope of this presentation, but Israel itself is a white settler colony, therefore founded on heterosis patriarchy and white heterosis patriarchy. So it's not the gay heaven that they make it to be. Um, but what is crucial here is to understand how some gay constituencies, some gay people are included within the apparatus of normativity more general. But this happens through the further exclusion of other people who are usually queer people of color, especially trans people of color and just trans people more generally. And we can also see this in the kind of rhetoric that a lot of us have probably heard 
from either our parents or family members or older friends who say um, that they're okay with gay people around as long as they do their things in private. So it's this kind of idea of a privatized gay constituency, something that is not visible, something that doesn't challenge heterosis patriarchy as the structural root of capitalism itself. And it's important that we see heterosis patriarchy as a structural component of capitalism and again not as a cultural one as early social reproduction theory was saying because it's the only way we can resist if we understand the disruptive power that queer and especially queer trans bodies of color have in the world um actually i'm gonna take a break here um and ask everyone if you have any questions on this first theoretical part before moving to the examples of Turkey. Oh, hi. Hello. Thank you so much, Philly. I was, I was really, really interesting. I'm just out walking my dog and I was really enjoying listening to that. Um, yeah, such a thought provoking and really got me thinking, especially about this, I, this like, almost like a like a paradox, I guess, um, of like family um, in that, I mean, you talked earlier about um, like unwaged work within families um, and the problematics of that, and that as being something that, yeah, is, diff is problematic. And then, yeah, also I was thinking about this idea of like chosen family and like mutual aid. And I was wondering like, how does that, how does that like potential emancipatory potential of mutual aid with through like chosen family, but also that being like unwaged work in a way, how does that chime with the problematics of unwaged work, if that makes sense? Yeah, um, that is kind of the conclusion of the presentation. So I'm going to answer, but not too much in detail because I don't okay. want to spoil. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> um, I think it's really crucial because yes, um, what care work usually does in contexts where especially again as i was saying before let's just think about like groups of trans working class poc people coming together or even like just the idea of a squat for instance occupying a building establishing a space where um a real alternative to neoliberalism is proposed is still unwaged labor it still comes as an unwaged labor because it is a way in which we are caring for ourselves and privatizing that cost but, and I will stop here, it's also resistance, and we will see that later. Um, but also what is actually I'm going to add, it's uh, really important, is that, and this is spoken about a lot in transgender Marxism, is also that within these groups, um, and within leftist politics more generally, I would say, um, if you think about it, all sort of like um, reproductive um, tasks within like an activist organization or a group of people coming together often fall on migratized queer poc and especially feminized people because it it still prevails that idea of a gender difference a gendered or sexual difference it still prevails a lot of time in the way we come together as radical activists or as activists or leftist activists more generally and it's important to think about it it's important to think how it's still unwaged labor and how yeah the revolution kind of starts from there as well kind of changing those social relations um i like to think about kind of rediffusing leadership thinking where does leadership stem from and leadership really stemming from the part of an organization that deals with care and putting the leadership in the hands of those who do the care work because that is the most crucial part because we wouldn't be here without the care without the reproduction thank you that's really really interesting and i can't wait to hear more and just this idea of checking in on ourselves and like reminding ourselves that we chose the family of mutual aid isn't just sunshine and roses as default there's also complexity to that so thank you i'm yeah really look forward to hearing more thank you <laughs> Is there any other question before I move on? Uh, yeah, Ishi. <laughs> Ishi, did you have your hand up or no? <laughs> nope. Okay. 
Um, yeah, Dorian. Um, on this point about uh, homo nationalism or, or you know nationalism in general, um, the way that, for example, um, Joe Biden or America in, in, in general and and several other countries, of course. Oh, if she says that their mic isn't working, <laughs> you could type it in chat if you want, I suppose. The question or whatever. Um, anyway, sorry, <laughs> before before I forget. Um, so, so the, uh, for example, the US um, response to um, homophobia in other countries um, being non-existent and, and very antagonistic. Um, the way that the, the, it's no longer, that is not a, a conversation about queer people. It's about, um, the domesticity, you know, the domicile, the country of protecting its own queer, queer people, um, as if, uh, you know, queer people are the property as if humans are not all human, <laughs> um, and so on. And, and actively, um, encouraging homophobia in other countries um, and queerphobia in other countries, transphobia in other countries. And then also, of course, in its own country, but um, in this sense, way worse, of course, um, abroad. And this being a, a form of cultural colonialism, um, like um, a strategy, uh, so to speak, um, for um, foreign policy, you know, for saying, oh yeah, actually, no, we're, we are the great, uh, country uh, <laughs> where you know we ha we 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 encourage human rights um and things like this anyway so what i mean to say is um we see the same thing happening of course in the uh palestine israel um conflict at the moment um and also in the past of people and this propaganda saying uh, one of these countries is safer than the other when that's absolutely not true. Um, and you, you, the, the lack of documentation or discussion that we have in the queer community, um, in regards to this. Um, so for example, you know, you have a picture up on, on the screen at the moment of, uh, pride, um, and this being somewhat of a national thing. And the fact that pride is no longer a protest in many areas, um, but a, a celebration of nationalism, really, <laughs> like, which I suppose is like a <laughs> quite a, a, a frightening thing to say. But anyway, <laughs> um, the fact yeah. that we do not confront this as a community um, necessarily, uh, we we are on the streets to celebrate ourselves and to celebrate um, things like this in our own country, as if as if we are safe, as if this thing is not way more complicated than it actually is and as, as if we do not have we are not playing an active role in that cultural colonialism yeah um, yeah that's really what i wanted to say and i just wondered what your thoughts were about that um yeah no it's it's an agenda that has been moved since such a long time like but even the not only with like um lgbtq rights but also uh women's rights women's freedom like um also the framing of the revolution happening in, happening in Iran like by western media it's such like a there's such a fetish with women take taking their hijab off you know and like it's it's so much more than that but like we always have this fetish um because it's a fetish of cultural otherness um and it's what happened with the invasion in Iraq for instance it was all justified on saving women and at the end it's like white men saving brown women from brown men like it just doesn't make any sense and yeah all of this are becoming techniques of invasion and techniques to continue occupation and apartheid as it's happening in palestine today um and really the when we are when i'm saying that um we have to think of heterosis patriarchy not as a cultural feature of capitalism but as a structural one it also plays into this 
it's not like the framing of homophobia or transphobia or queerphobia as a cultural feature of another society is completely wrong because heterosis patriarchy is not culture, it's structure, it's the way we come together, it's the way we the way the world is envisioned, every social and material relation we are in is heterosis patriarchal. And then, of course, we kind of try and put up alternative modes of being together. And that's really important. And that's what I'm going to kind of talk at the end about at the end of the presentation. But this um, division between um, patriarchy as, as actually structural, because one realizes unwaged labor, but then seeing homophobia as cultural is very, it's very dangerous. It really fits into this sort of, um, this sort of orientalizing and neo-colonial discourses um, that we're seeing at the moment. Um, and it does, and it takes the attention away from how all of capitalism is queerphobic and transphobic. There's no other way. It wouldn't be capitalism otherwise. Any other questions before we move on? All right. Um, so now I'm going to get into the example of Turkey. And I'm heavily citing a book that is Queer in Translation, Sexual Politics under Neoliberal Islam by Evren Safci, um, written in 2020. Um, and it's a really good book because, first of all, it uses a methodology that is critical translation approach. Um, it's not firstly developed by Savci, but I think she's the one who kind of like brought so many different contributions into one methodology. Um, because she looks at the traveling of queer terminology of both oppression and resistance. And this is really important because um, instead of understanding the travel of hate crime law demands or more generally queer politics to the context of contemporary Turkey as a simple mimicry of Western LGBT, LGBT politics or seeking radical alterity in the subjects that speak it, the critical translation approach that Savci takes on demands that we see the significant parallels between this context including the ways in which neoliberal urban restructuring and neoliberalism more generally um, and increasing authoritarian securitization of space unfold in each other. So the um, instead of like taking the example of Turkey as a mimicry or analyzing Turkey from um, frameworks that are Western, Savci looks at the specific context and looks at the overlaps. But at the same time, she doesn't even um, fall into the trap of cultural relativism or a mere cultural, like a mere focus on cultural otherness. And she doesn't see Turkey in a vacuum in the world or as a product of simple is of Islam or as the culture of Turkey. She sees Turkey as always in a dialectic relationship with the rest of the world. And that's how we should um, talk about, um, I think, the global south or non-Western context more generally. Um, all right, so um, she gives us a lot of information about the history of Turkey um, that I've kind of summarized for you. So in the 1980s, there was a big change in Turkey, and that was uh, the intervention of the World Bank. Um, and that kind of happened all over the world, not just Turkey, but uh, the World Bank bank demanded structural adjustment policies, meaning freeing markets, privatizing certain parts of the state apparatus, um, and especially rapid urbanization in Turkey started taking place. Um, what Savci tells us is that these changes demanded by the World Bank brought a change in the discursive framework of security that the state was employing. Before, the Turkish state was very much concerned with um, what it used to call, and it still calls, Kurdish terrorism, um, which, uh, was, which is and was a um, phenomenon much more relegated to rural areas of Turkey, because relegated to Kurdistan, so not even Turkey, Kurdistan. But, um, in the 1980s, there was a shift that Savci documents um, in, the, in, in how um, politicians were talking about security. And 
the um, idea of security and what spaces need to be securitized shifted from just rural areas to rural areas and urban areas. And it included, um, which was definitely present before, but it heightened a focus on another type of terrorist or person constructed as a terrorist. That was the a trans person, the trans uh, bad Turkish public, especially, and I say this because the book mostly talks about trans women in Turkey and trans sex workers in Turkey. And therefore, this security discourse starts being centered around the transvestite terror. So literally, it um, um, it develops an idea of terror, fear, and hate, um, which are all uh, affects which still play in um, what we construct as a terrorist. Again, let's think about Palestine today. Um, and the focus really shifted on uh, trans people. There was a, a stage ban in the 19, 1980s for trans performers. And this is really crucial, especially when we talk about social reproduction, because it really took a space away from trans people, a space where they could come together, a space where they could perform, and also where they could access transition, because, and I will get into that, I think, later, but as um, the book Transgender Marxism says, transition is not just a process of identity um, development. It's a process that is embedded in social and material relations and destroying that space where those relations can take place, where we, and here I'm citing, I remember like transgender Marxism saying this, it's a space where we give each other gender, where we give each other a new gender, a new way of being together in a gendered way. Um, that we reinvent, taking that space away is really crucial because it undermines social reproduction and literally the survival of trans people. Um, what happens, of course, is there is a rise of sex work and brothels because it, they become a space where trans women can be together uh, and can provide for themselves. Um, of course, this is not inherently bad in itself, um, but it does participate in a conflation of trans women and sex work which definitely was a bit less present before when trans women could also find uh, communal spaces and spaces of expression. And also um, they could sustain themselves because they were getting paid through performance on stages and that was banned. Um, and Safchi looks specifically at the development of an ideology and a state doctrine that brings to this and it's Islamic liberalism. She defines it as the marriage of formal democracy, free market capitalism, and a toned down conservative Islam. And this becomes even more clear in the 2000s with the rise to power of the AKP, which is the party that Erdogan um, founded and he's still part of, um, which um, at the time, it's a bit different from how it was today, but of course there's like overlaps and we can like looking retrospectively, what the AKP is today could could have been prevented and, and we could have seen it um, as like queer activist um, because the AKP at the moment was kind of um, promoting this idea of a moderate uh, liberal Islam and this is really crucial because it was seen as progressive it is very progressive and effectively because Turkey used to be a secular society it used to be a secular state where religion expression just as in france right now was not allowed um and the fact that a state was freeing its market so that was seen as progressive but at the same time was integrating the not even religious part of it but the cultural part of islam into the state was seen as very progressive and very positive and i could argue that it was um prides were taking place at the time as well prides were taking place until 2015 in turkey um, so a lot of queer activists were criticizing Erdogan, AKP at the moment, but also there was a, a, there was a rhetoric of, oh, queer people are being included somehow within the Turkish nation state. There was a big change though, because trans people were not. And that became clear in 2005. There was a modification to a law um, which um, made, um, which, signified a shift in the way the state was intervening in sex work. Um, so it kind of brought to the end of brothels, brothels in Turkey, or at least um, 
non-underground brothels. Um, and trans women started getting fined for literally just being in public because of the association of sex work and trans women. Um, so it was regardless of whether they were seeking clients in that moment or whether they were walking their dogs, they were getting fined for just being see like visible in public. And this is another shift that is crucial is that if before the police was intervening into sex work communally, so as a communal body, it was, it was intervening into sex work as a communal activity, so kind of negotiating with brothels and brothels owners, it shifted because the police started finding one woman at a time, one trans woman at a time. So the um, the crime became individualized instead of being communal and this is really important it's really important because as an extension of this sex work and here i'm citing was respecialized and remapped from the brothel onto the bodies of trans women second the law worked to codify extortion and position the state as the direct beneficiary through the fines basically and third the law ultimately was employed um, towards banishing trans women from the public sphere altogether. Therefore, the law is best understood as part of a larger system that marked trans sex workers' bodies simultaneously as surplus existence, so as disposable bodies, and extractable labor, so also as exploitable bodies. So again, simultaneously, extractability and disposability. Um, let me switch. So, yeah, what Sabji is telling us is that Islamic morality was really weaponized in Turkey at the moment to justify a neoliberal development of the state, but especially, and now we'll get into it, an urban development of Turkey. She's linking the banning of Pride marches post-2015. So in 2015, what happened was that in Taksim Square, out of nowhere in Istanbul, the police attacked Pride. And after that, Prides were banned. Um, and she links it to the events of 2013 um, with the Gazi Park protests in Istanbul, which were opposing the urban development of Gazi Park. Gazi Park was an area habitated mostly by trans women uh, that were living together communally, and they started slowly getting evicted, getting um, also through the fines, like their means of subsistence were um deleted basically uh, and their money was extorted by the state and they were pushed out of the neighborhood to give space to new families that wanted to move into this neighborhood so a process of gentrification as we're seeing today as well everywhere in the world everywhere in big cities in the world it was happening at the same time in ankara in ulker sokak that is ulker street in ankara same process was taking place trans sex trans sex workers were kicked out uh, and evicted from their properties. Um, and it was really uh, pushed by a rationale of cleansing the space, cleansing the space from bad publics, cleansing the space from publics that are not respectable. And again, tying from the theory that I was talking about before, cleansing the space from bodies that are not productive, properly productive or properly reproductive, whose Productive activity is criminalized because it's sex work and whose reproductive activity is not recognized as properly productive because it doesn't participate in the reproduction of the nucleus heteronormative family. So the fines, as I was saying, and this is really crucial because it kind of brings us beyond a binary between exploitability and disposability, these fines were ex ex expelling these women from the neighborhood, but they were also extracting value and dispossessing them. And citing and reading this quote, as scholars have noted, the containment of so-called bad publics became especially becomes especially important when cities try to package and market various areas to respectable middle classes, so to families, uh, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, the value of bodies marked as surplus existence is precisely their valuelessness signaling areas of investability in times of speculative finance. And this is really crucial, the valuelessness of some bodies. And it links really well to what J.K. Wang talks about in her Carceral Capitalism, uh, the book I was talking about before, because she really talks about debt and the use of debt by the U.S. state to extract values from bodies that are 
seen as valueless, and that's the ultimate extraction of value through debt, also through fines and through a predatory state. Um, and then in the US, but not only in the US, I'm sure um, there's a pipeline between debt and prisons, no? Who can't pay back, goes to prison, serves time in prison. So then it also fits into a discussion of how capitalism is not only heterosis patriarchal, but it's carceral, um, which sadly is beyond the scope and the time of this presentation, but just keep it in mind. And here we just have a picture from, um, the, from a protest happening in uh, Istanbul in 2016. The picture is from NBC News. And it was a process where 100 people came into the streets uh, because of the murder of an LGBTQ activist in Istanbul. So just to show that resistance was still always present and it's still so, so present in Turkey at the moment. And I actually forgot to add it, but I will add it to the slides so that if anyone wants them, I can send them. There's also a really good playlist of videos on YouTube from there's like 15 different videos, like 15 different activists that talk about trans Istanbul and the lives of trans women and the resistance, political resistance of trans women in Istanbul today. Um, I will add it to this slide uh, so that if you then want the slides, you can access the videos as well. Um, we're almost done. Um, are we out of time, Doran? Should I? We are we are coming up on half past, but you can, you know, yeah, for another it's like ten minutes. Few minutes. Yeah, five to ten minutes. Yeah. Um, so the part I wanted to get now to, which is what Cass was um commenting on before is resistance and trans social reproduction as resistance. So until now we kind of talked about social reproduction as unwaged labor, henceforth as an exploitation. But it's really important to um, look at the arguments of queer Marxists, but also of black feminists, uh, such as Patricia Hill Collins, that says that say that certain bodies that are deemed as disposable, the, the fact itself that they're reproducing and that they're reproducing in a sense of reproducing their own body and surviving within this world is an act of resistance itself. Uh, Meg Wesling calls this queer value and queer values kind of all of the activities that as queer people we engage in to survive. Um, and therefore care work and social reproduction are not just exploitation, but they're also self-determination. They are, um, they create spaces where there's knowledge and praxis of resistance, where reproduction and care become survival vis-a-vis -vis the continuous rearticulation of the nuclear family and the exclusion that family carries. It's, we need to reconceive of socially reproductive labor from the perspective of queer people and trans people because this brings us to consider socially reproductive labor and care work both as work of resistance that enables our being but also as unpaid labor, complicating once again a binary understanding of exploitation and dispossessions and what I wanted to get at also of redistribution and recognition, which poses really good questions to our organizing, because it's like, do we stop at recognition? Do we merely demand recognition within a system that doesn't want us? No, but it's also good to ask for recognition. It's a way of calling out the structures of hate, that affect that wants us dead, but also we need to call for redistribution because it's not enough to be recognized. Our existence represents unwaged labor to exist in this world we have to do so much more labor than a heterosexual person just because we're queer or because we're trans so yeah kind of complicating that binary between redistribution and recognition um and then just to finish this is a picture of sylvia rivera who with Mar part marsha p johnson um in New York uh, was organizing towards literally alternative structures of care, alternative structures of being together. Um, Star, Street Transfestives, Action Revolutionaries was uh, a liberation movement, a third world liberation movement um, that was helping street queens and homeless gay youth by sheltering them in hotel rooms at the beginning in 1971 when it was founded and then into a big building that they were renting for uh, about 200 something dollars and I can't find the 
the figure but yeah uh from the mafia in uh new york um and that was giving literally spaces to survive for trans and queer people of color in New York at the time. There would be an extra slide that I'm going to skip sadly because I want to take questions at the end. But if you want, I can send you the slide and you can kind of read it over. And if you want, go to the article that is the afterlife of gender, sovereignty, intimacy, and Muslim funerals of transgender people in Turkey, which kind of talks about ways of resisting, but it's really interesting because it's kind of a resistance in the afterlife of a trans person through mourning and communal grieving. And the way I analyzed it is grieving communally also as like grieving is socially reproductive labor because it's a way we reinvent our communities. Um, but yeah, questions? Also, this is a picture of Marsha P. Johnson holding a cigarette and a sign that says power to the people. Hi, sorry, I think uh, Hayden has a question. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Yeah, go on. Is it? Um, I don't have a question. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was it was very good. I don't. I think a lot of it I didn't understand because I think it was very theory, and I'm not very versed in that. But mm. thanks for like. I'm definitely gonna read the books, um, if I can. But yeah, it's not something I usually go down. So I, I thank you for the insight. Yes. That's all right. And let me know. Um, I'm going to put my main email, personal email, in the chat so I can send um, the slides to whoever wants them. Maybe like kind of reading them through uh, makes it a bit more accessible as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Sorry, I was just wrestling with my cat's claws. They got stuck mm -hmm. on my jumper and I couldn't move. Um, thank you so much for for all of the you know clear labor that you've, I've, I've as you're speaking of, of labor, the labor that you put in uh, to that presentation. My God, you know, I felt like I was back at university and you were a, a lecturer. You know, they should be being paid five hundred pounds an hour or whatever. <laughs> No, thank you for giving me the space. Also, this is the bibliography of um, yeah the academic sources. So if anyone wants to like take a picture so that it's easier to access them, um, yeah, here it is. And also have like PDFs of all of this. So if like some of you are not in uni and like don't have access to the sources, again, you can email me and I can like link all of the PDFs uh, so that you have them.